without further ado, my, my friend and brother, Mark Whitaker. Bill. I am so blessed to be here tonight. In all that stuff about a Cornell PhD and number four at one of the largest companies in the world, it's all meaningless. It means nothing. It took me to age 41 to figure that out. And I'm 58 years old now. But I figured it out. And the only thing that means anything to me, we all have a purpose in life that God gives us. All of us. And the purpose that God has given me is to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And I will travel to the corners of the earth to be a witness for Jesus as long as I can get on an airplane. I was just in Jerusalem about five weeks ago, presenting there. And I will do that till I can't get on a plane anymore. Because I feel strongly that is my purpose in life, to be a witness for Jesus Christ. So what I ask you to do, if you don't know what the purpose God has given you yet, as we're sharing tonight about how I found my purpose, and as these days and weeks ahead, as you pray during your quiet time, pray for God to lead you to what your purpose, the skill set that he's given you, and how you can use that best to serve him. That's what I pray for tonight. And that's what I've been praying for the days ahead, the days in the past prior to this event. That I've been praying that God would put the right people in the right seats and that you would start praying, if you don't know your purpose yet, what your purpose for your life is for him. I'd like to talk about uh, what Bill said about the, the Marketplace Ambassador Initiative and what a Marketplace Ambassador looks like. And before I get into what the Marketplace Ambassador Initiative is, which is a movement of, of businessmen getting together and sharing and getting stronger and getting more equipped and, and working together and praying for the city, before I get into the details of that, I'd like to paint a picture of what a Marketplace Ambassador looks like before we talk about the initiative itself. And by doing that, I'd like to share a little bit of my testimony about where I met two ambassadors for Christ face-to-face -face and share the impact they've had on my life. When I was a lot younger man, when I was 32 years old, I was living in Frankfurt, Germany. I was vice president of a very large company called Degusa. We had about 50,000 employees at Degusa. Um, I was vice president over acquisitions and mergers. And I was doing a joint venture with a company for a couple years out of Frankfurt, Germany, with a company called ADM, Archer Daniels Midland. And I got to know the CEO very well of Archer Daniels Midland, the 75-year-old CEO. I got to know the 69-year-old president very well. They were building plants in Europe, and they were building plants in China. And we were building some of those manufacturing plants alongside them in joint ventures, and I was responsible for those joint ventures. And one day, the CEO of that company asked me of ADM, Archer Daniels Midland, the 56th largest company in America back then in 1989. They're the 34th largest company in America today, by the way, on the Fortune 500. When well, Frankfurt, Germany, he asked me, he said, Mark, what's your, what's your salary at Degusa? I said, well, I've been with Degusa since, since I graduated from Cornell, about six years now. I got my PhD in biochemistry from Cornell. And I said, I'd make about 400,000 U.S. dollars. I was living in Germany, so I was paid in Deutschmarks not in U.S. dollars. I said about 400,000 U.S. dollars with bonuses, stock options, and base salary, and so on. He said, well, Mark, I'll, I'll pay you almost tenfold. I'll give you a $350,000 base salary, but give you bonuses and stock options that can equate to about $3 million a year if you meet certain performance parameters. I didn't know God at that time. I was all full of myself. I was practicing selfish leadership, not servant leadership. And I said, where do I sign? So I signed this employee, employee agreement back then, 1989. Again, I was 32 years old. Moved to Decatur, Illinois, where the world headquarters of ADM is located. What ADM does is the following. And by the way, I want to emphasize, in 1989, just like ADM today, they had 30,000 hardworking people going to work, doing the right thing morally and ethically every day. So ADM was not a bad company, had some tremendous employees. But what it did have was four rotten apples at the top of the company, and I was one of them. And we were the four top leaders of that company, 
And we ran that company like it was our personal piggy bank, very similar like what you saw in the or Enron and WorldCom cases. We ran that company like it was our personal, like our own personal company, not the public company that it was. And all four of us went to federal prison and we deserved everything we got. Probably deserved even more punishment than what we got. So I asked, told the CEO, I joined the company and moved to Decatur, Illinois. And I can remember my first day at ADM. And by the way, what ADM produces, what you have for breakfast today, lunch today, and dinner tonight, it likely had something from ADM in it. One of the largest food additive companies in the world. It would be difficult to go to the grocery store and buy a Kellogg cereal or an orange juice or a Kraft or Pillsbury or a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi or a Sprite. All of those foods have ingredients from ADM in it. Again, one of the largest companies in the world. They were $70 billion in revenue when I joined them. They're almost $85 billion in revenue today. Number 34 on the Fortune 500 today. My, my position that I had when I joined them, I was divisional president of the biotech division and corporate vice president of the company. So out of the 30,000 employees that we had when I joined, 4,000 employees were in the division that I was responsible for. The company was split into four separate divisions, like four separate companies. And here I am, 32 years old, a 75-year-old CEO, a 69-year-old president, and I'm number four in the company with the other executives, almost triple, at least double my age. So I thought, boy, I've got room to move up. All I had to do is wait till they, till they retire. I remember my first day I got there, the CEO the CEO came back to my office and he said, uh, introduce me to two pilots. This is my first day at work from Frankfurt, Germany. By the way, moving from Frankfurt, Germany to Decatur, Illinois is quite a change. Huge change. Uh, went through a, from a big city. My wife and I loved Frankfurt, lived there four years. Our children went to a German school. Our youngest son was born in Germany. And we really saw living a lifetime uh, in Europe. And we moved back to Decatur, Illinois, Decatur, Illinois an 80,000 people city. 30,000 of the 80,000 were employees of ADM. So basically everybody in that city was an employee of, a spouse of, or a child of, of ADM. It was definitely a company town. As you can imagine, 30,000 employees out of 80,000 people in the city. So they introduced me to two pilots on my first day, and they said, Mark, these are your pilots. Two miles from here, we have our hangar at the Decatur, Decatur, Illinois airport, and you have a Falcon 50 waiting for you. The seven top executives each have their own Falcon 50. You're number four top executive, so you got a Falcon 50 as of today. I tell you, I had my Justin Bieber, my Britney Spears, my Charlie Sheen moment all in one month. I'm 32 years old, 70, seven years out of college, and I got a Falcon 50 sitting there. I tell you, I thought I was Bon Jovi. I had hair back then, too, by the way. So now let's get to the second week at work. My second week at work, the CEO came back to my office, and he said, Mark, have you moved your family from, Decatur, or from Frankfurt, Germany yet? And I said, well, I've only been here a week, but we're looking at houses and hope to move them soon. And uh, we'll move here probably in a month once we find a house to move into. And he said, why don't you buy my home? And I said, well, tell me a little about your home. Why would you leave it? And he said, well, I'm 75. I want to move to something smaller. I want to live by the uh, airport. And I don't like the half hour commute that I have in the Decatur every day. And I said, well, tell me, tell me a little about your home. And he said, well, it's 13,000 square feet. It's got an eight-car garage. It's got three golf greens on the property. It's got a bowling alley in the basement. Uh, it's got horse riding arena that your kids, when it's zero degrees outside, can ride in an inside heated arena where it will be 60 degrees for your kids to ride horses when it's zero outside. And I said, boy, I think that's a little bit. Eight-car garage. I said, I think that's a little bit, much, a little bit too much of a house for me. He said, that's nonsense. He said, I'll give you a $500,000 startup bonus today. If you buy my home, he said it was the original house of John Daniels, the founder of Archer Daniels Midland, 115 years earlier. A house that was built in 1846. A house that Abe Lincoln visited. In, a house that when, when Dwayne Andreas was the CEO of ADM, that Gorbachev visited that house. And um, he said, I'll give you a $500,000 startup bonus today if you buy it. And he said, I own all the banks. I own this town. I'll call the banks and get you a low interest rate. So my second week at work, I bought his house. By week three, it was pretty boring. I had to start working. <laughs> so I moved my wife to this 13,000-square-foot uh, house with an eight-car garage. What's a 32-year-old do when he doesn't know Jesus with an eight-car garage? He fills it with eight cars. So within a couple months' time, I had a Ferrari, two BMWs, two Mercedes. Keep in mind, with bonuses, I was earning $3 million a year, and this is 1989. Base salary alone was 350000 a year without even any bonuses whatsoever. 
So like I said, I was on a, what I thought I was, found the success that I always deserved, what I went to Cornell for, why I went to an Ivy League for. When I thought I was at the pinnacle of my success, I was really at the beginning of my demise. I just didn't realize it. I didn't realize it yet. So fast forward a couple years. Now I'm 35 years old, a couple years with the company, almost three years with the company. My wife's 34. And by the way, I've known my wife almost my whole life. I met my wife when she was in seventh grade, and I was in eighth grade. My mom took us to the junior high dance. Her mom brought us home. Grew up in a small town about an hour north of Cincinnati, a little town called Morrow, Ohio. We actually live near that, uh, live near that town now. And um, we've been married 37 years. And I know to say married 37 years uh, doesn't mean a lot to, to a lot of you. A lot of you have been married maybe 40, 45, even 50 years. But I will tell you, and you will hear by the end of my story, for me to say that I'm married 37 years to the woman I married 37 years ago is a miracle of God. That she stayed with me with what I'm about ready to share with you, what I put her through. Only God could allow and encourage and keep a marriage together like our marriage stayed together. A miracle of God. So my wife saw all these changes in me. She Set me down one day on November 5th, 1992. I'm three years with the company. And she said, well, Mark, what's going on with your life? She said, she said that all you do is, is work. She said, I think you're an addict. And I said, what do you mean an addict? I don't drink. I don't do drugs. All I do is work. She said, exactly. You're a workaholic. I, she said, the minute you wake up till the minute you go be to bed, that's all you've done the last three years at ADM. And I said, Ginger, well, I have to work like that. 90% of my income is in stock options and bonuses. The more I work, the more I earn. I have to work like that. She said, you know what, Mark? I'd rather have two, car, two Fords in the driveway, have a 2,000 square foot house, and have my husband at home. She said, I'm feeling like a widow here. She said, I, I, you're not the man I fell in love with in high school. She said, you go to church, and I know you say you're a believer, but I don't see any fruit in your life. So as I was getting more obsessed with the power and materialism and titles of being in corporate America and climbing the ladder, my wife was really growing in her faith with God. And we were becoming unequally yoked. And she was challenging me with that. And she said the thing that bothered her the most was on this November 5th, 1992 date, she said the last seven months that I've worked there, out of the three years, I'd come home, I'd have dinner with the family when I'm not traveling, and I'd be on the phone three or four hours a night. After dinner, she said, she said, you're on the phone, Mark, until her and the kids, the three children are in bed. So even after dinner, I'm not with the family. And I said, Ginger, I have to be on the phone at night because I'm talking to Southeast Asia, Japan, Singapore, South Korea. And eight o'clock at night in Decatur, Illinois is eight o'clock in the morning in Southeast Asia. So I have to be on the phone three or four hours at night. She said, well, who would you be talking to in Southeast Asia three or four hours every night the last seven months? And I said, well, ADM assigned a mentor to me. We all need mentors in our life, but this is not the mentor that you want to have. I said, ADM signed a mentor to me to show me how to do price fixing. They said they're in the commodity business, and the only way you survive the commodity business is get together with your competitors and fix the prices of all those ingredients that go in your foods, that go in your Kellogg cereal, that go in your uh, beverage, that goes in your orange juice. We were fixing the prices of all those ingredients, she said, well, how much you earn doing that, the company? I said, we earn an extra billion dollars a year. Not a million, but a billion. She said, how long have they been doing it? I said, for 12 years. She said, a billion dollars a year for 12 years in a row? You're stealing from your own customers? Why would you do that, Mark? And I said, Ginger, everybody does it. They tell me you can't survive without doing it. If I'm going to move up in this company... The CEO's been there 35 years. The president's been there 27 years. It's the only way I'm going to survive by doing this and learning this and able to take this over when they retire. She said, Mark, I don't know if I can live with this. She said, who pays for the price fixing? And I said, well, when someone goes to the grocery store, like all of you, and you buy $50 worth of groceries, you pay an extra 3 or $4 only, I told her. 3 or $4 only when they go to the grocery store out of $50. She said, you mean my grandma that earns $300 a week on Social Security, 82 years old, is paying for, for price fixing on her ingredients from her groceries, which is her main expense, her grocery bill, and we're living in a mansion with an eight-car garage? She said, Mark, I don't think I can live with this. 
And then I heard the thing I never wanted to hear. She said she was going to go back up in her study and pray about it, and we would talk later. I knew then I was in trouble. She came back down an hour later and said, Mark, God led her to a decision. She said, you're, you're involved with a crime for seven months. It's been going on for 12 years. You've only been at the company for three years, and it's been going on for 12 years. What a perfect time to turn yourself in. I said, Ginger, if I turn myself in to the authorities, the CEO picks up the phone and talks to U.S. presidents. He went to President Nixon's funeral on the plane with President Clinton. I said, he's so well connected, he'll come after me with everything he has. And I said, I could even go to jail for this. This is illegal to be price fixing. She said, you know what, Mark? I don't think you will go to jail because you're only involved seven months and it's been going on for 12 years. But if you do, I'll stay with you. I know that's easy to say, but I'm going to share. She lived it. She lived it. I don't have the normal resume of a white-collar criminal. Went to Ohio State University for my bachelor's and master's. Got a Ph.D. in biochemistry from Cornell. I shared this slide at the Lansing, Michigan prayer breakfast about three years back. And I said, I don't have the normal resume of a white-collar criminal. Well, I know not to share that in Michigan. Because someone stood in the back with 800 in the audience and said, if you went to Ohio State, you are a white-collar criminal. <laughs> so I know I can't show that slide in, in Michigan. So as I shared this story with Ginger, a case that was going on for 12 years, she forced me to, she said, either you turn yourself into the FBI or she's going to do it. The very day that I told her, we're sitting for four hours with the FBI. I don't know how many of you have ever went to the FBI and told them you're stealing a billion dollars a year, but I can tell you it's an interesting reaction. I can tell you from firsthand experience. This phone was ringing off the hook. The FBI reached the Attorney General. The FBI reached William Sessions, who was director of the FBI at the time. This became the largest antitrust price-fixing case, international cartel in U.S. history. If you go to the FBI Museum today at the FBI headquarters in D.C., it has the equipment I wore undercover in the museum. That's how big this case was. Now, the FBI told me, when we're sitting for four hours with the FBI, my wife by my side, we had no attorney. I was 35 years old. She was 34. We were young and naive. We didn't know what we were doing. Sitting there confessing for four hours with the FBI. So my wife acted like my lawyer at the time. She said, well, good. My husband came in and did the right thing. Now you can go tap phones and do whatever you do, but we can go home now, right? The FBI said, your husband can't go home. He just confessed to a billion dollar a year theft a year. He's the only witness, he's the only defendant we have at this point. I either have to arrest him today, the FBI said, or he has to start wearing a wire tomorrow and be a witness against the other executives. And that's how I became an FBI informant. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the difference right there between a whistleblower and an informant. A whistleblower is someone who sacrifices everything to do the right thing. That's my wife, Ginger. An informant is one who starts wearing a wire to get less punishment and a lower sentence in a reduced prison term. And that was me. And that's the difference between a whistleblower and an informant. So the next day I met the FBI agents. They had four agents they assigned to me. I met, uh, they rotated in twos. I had to meet two each morning, six o'clock in the morning. The next morning they shaved my chest, hooked microphones to my chest, had a tape recorder at my back with an athletic band, had another tape recorder in a briefcase, another tape recorder in a notebook, three different tape recorders. That way they're capturing something on, on tape, even if one of them breaks. And I met those FBI agents at 6 o'clock in the morning every day for three years and wore a wire eight, nine, ten hours a day every day for three years. The longest duration of anybody to wear a wire in U.S. history. And I don't recommend any of you to break that record, by the way. <laughs> Traveling around the world with us, the FBI knew they were going up against one of the biggest companies in the world, a $70 billion company, number 56 on the Fortune 500, the 90th largest company in the world. So the FBI knew this was going to be a jury trial. It was going to, they were, ADM was going to spend a lot of resources to defend themselves. And so this green lamp that I'm showing here now, that made the video feed. The video camera was in that lamp. So the audio tapes were on me, but the video camera was in that lamp. And the FBI would always be in the next room, and they could control that video camera in that lamp with a remote control. So when someone was talking in that group of 11 that we were fixing prices with, with our competitors, they could focus on that person. 
zoom in, capture that. Someone's riding on, a, on an easel. We didn't have whiteboards then. We had the flip charts. Someone's riding on a flip chart. They would capture that with this video camera in that lamp. Ladies and gentlemen, that green lamp was at the Shangri-La Hotel, a $1,000 a night hotel. Two weeks later, the same 11 guys, five feet from them again, that green lamp was at the Mandarin Hotel in Hong Kong. It was in Singapore in the Shangri-La. Four weeks after that, ladies and gentlemen, that same green lamp, the same 11 guys, was at the Four Seasons Hotel in Chicago. That green lamp was at every meeting, two or three times a month, the same 11 guys for three years. And they never noticed. <laughs> they never noticed. Five feet from them. From this here, from that table there. Thank God there wasn't a woman, a woman criminal among us. Because I'm convinced if we had a woman criminal among us, a woman would have said, you know what, that green lamp has fallen us around the world. <laughs> but you take 11 guys earning millions of dollars in bonuses on a billion dollar crime each for their companies. One thing I learned was this, and I learned it well being an informant. Greed blinds you. It blinds you. They didn't see what was five feet from them. All they kept looking at was that white easel when they were talking about with the next price increase how much money we were going to make. The dollar signs were in their head, and they didn't see the lamp that was five feet from them. After two years wearing a wire, the FBI was so appreciative of me wearing a wire. Every day when they wired me up, they said, Mark, if these guys catch you, they're going to kill you. And they wired me up at six every morning for three years. They said, this is serious stuff. These guys are going to kill you if they catch you. So after two years wearing a wire, I couldn't hardly sleep at night thinking about what's the company going to do when they learn, when they're going to jail, and the reason why they're going to the jail, because I collected all this evidence against them. And I couldn't think about anything at night except that. So after two years wearing a wire, keep, mind, I wore, keep in mind I wore one for three. But after two years wearing a wire, I was out on my driveway at three in the morning during a thunderstorm. And there's a very accurate depiction of this on my website called markwhitaker.com. And there's a Discovery Channel documentary with the four real FBI agents and Ginger and I and all the real people involved in this case on this 2010 documentary. And this is one of the longest scenes that I'm ready to describe. I'm out on the driveway at three in the morning and the Discovery Channel had actors reenact this scene. I'm blowing leaves off during a thunderstorm, had my microphone still on my chest, had the tape recorder on my back, had my shirt and tie on, three in the morning blowing leaves off this driveway during this horrific thunderstorm in Decatur, Illinois. And I thought that was normal behavior. I couldn't imagine why the neighbors weren't doing the same. So Ginger heard from the bedroom, when did that gas leaf blow during this storm, thunderstorm. She said, what's Mark doing out on the driveway? So she comes running out on the driveway. And she says, Mark, come back to the house. Come back to the family. She said, most importantly, you need God in your life. She said, it's 3 in the morning. You've got to meet the FBI at 6. I said, Ginger, I know I've got to meet him at 6. I've been meeting him at 6 every morning for the last two years. I know what i got to do. She said, Mark, you need God in your life. I'm telling you, you need God. And I said, Ginger, why would I need God? ADM just announced when the 69-year-old president retires, I'm going from number four from divisional president to company president. I'm going from number four executive out of 30,000 executives to number two. From number four to number two, why do I need God? And she said, boy, Mark, do you need God? And you need him now more than ever. And she said, you've got to be delusional to think you're going to be the next president. I said, Ginger, they announced in Fortune magazine. When our next president retired, she said, I know you showed me that Fortune magazine a thousand times already. But she said, the only reason why they announced you're the next president, they don't know you're the informant. She said, the 17 board members are all friends and family of the CEO, and he's been there 35 years. Some of them's his nephew, one of them's his daughter, one of them's his brother. When, you, when they learn that you're a witness against them and that you've been wearing a wire, they're going to fire you. Surely you don't think they're all going to jail and you're going to go to work like nothing happened. That's how delusional I was after wearing a wire for two years. She's right, I was delusional. I didn't agree yet that I needed God, but I did agree with her that I was delusional. She walked back in that house. I stayed out on that thunderstorm with that gas leaf blower. And I started thinking, gosh, I looked around at that home, that eight-car garage, those horse stables across the street. And I thought, I've had this for seven and a half years. How can I live without it? I deserve this. How can I live without this? And if I get fired, how am I going to pay for my kids to be in private schools? 
to pay for that house and the security guards that we had and all the, in, in the house and all the things and materialism that I was trying to keep up with to meet the world's standard of success. And I thought, well, back in 94 when I was out on that driveway blowing those leaves off, it was often in Wall Street journals when a top executive got fired, he walked away with a 10, 20, 30 million dollar golden parachute. So I thought, well, they'll fire me, but they'll give me a golden parachute, 10 or 20 million dollars. That way I could keep that same standard of living for three or four years until I get back on my feet. Because people who wear wires don't get a job easily back in corporate America. They're not popular in corporate America. And I'm only mid-30s by that point. So I had to get another job. I couldn't live the rest of my life on what we had. Especially the way I was living and, and what I was spending, two, three million dollars a year to live there. So I asked that. I asked myself, would I get a golden parachute? And I said, no, I'm not. And then I thought, well, look, they just announced I'm the next president. I'll write my own golden parachute. What can they do? The accountants the county, the are scared to death of me. Uh, they just announced I'm the next president. If they go to the management, the accountants, and said, Mark is stealing money from us, and my management come to me, all I would have to say is, you guys are stealing a billion dollars a year for 12 years in a row. How can you go after me for a few million? Because their fraud and their theft was so large. So I thought, man, I'm the smartest guy in the room. Thank God I went to Cornell, I thought. I'm really going to fool these guys. I'm going to steal my own severance package. I'm going to steal my own golden parachute. And they're not even going to be able to do anything about it because they're involved with a lot bigger fraud. So I went in the next day. Thought, well, how much would it take to get uh, until I could get back on my feet? And I was thinking about nine million dollars. I was earning about three million dollars a year with stock options and bonuses. Nine million would give me three years that same standard of living to be able to keep that house, keep my kids in the private school, and so on. So I wrote, wrote one check for three and a half million. A few weeks later, I wrote another one for two and a half million until I wrote five checks that was nine million. Management didn't do anything. Like I said, what could they do? They're still in a billion dollars a year for twelve years in a row. The accountants were scared to death of me. I was announced I was going to be the next president from divisional president. So like I said, I thought I was the smartest guy in the room. What I didn't realize, the day that they learned when the case went public and the FBI had the raid and took their computers and took all their paperwork out of their offices, and the day they learned I was the one wearing a wire for three years and the witness against them, they made the decision, look, Mark Whitaker put us in flames for the price fixing. Let's put him in flames for the fraud. So I ended up telling on them on price fixing, and they ended up telling me for fraud. They went to prison for price fixing, and I went to prison for that $9 million fraud. We just all ended up telling on each other, but for different crimes. The amazing thing is the FBI, two of them being Christians out of the four at that time, and three are Christians today out of that group, they still showed up at my house, the FBI agents, when they were told about the $9 million. And they said, Mark, we're going to do everything we can to help you. We know you've been cracking under the pressure of wearing a wire for three years. We should have never let you wear a wire for three years. Ginger's been telling us about you out on the driveway at three in the morning during thunderstorms and not sleeping at night and still meeting us at six o'clock in the morning every day for three years. So for that, we're going to get you the best plea agreement we can get you. You had full immunity signed by a U.S. attorney before this $9 million fraud, we can't give you full immunity. But we get you the best plea agreement. So I went from full immunity to a plea agreement. And I was never to be charged. But I got in my own way with this $9 million fraud. So the, the FBI agents went to the prosecutor in, U, in Chicago. The head U.S. attorney. And the FBI agent said, Mark Whitaker is the highest level executive ever to turn whistleblower in U.S. history. He stole $9 million at a time his mental stability was at its worst. FBI agents, when they go undercover, they have to see a psychiatrist every three months to help deal with a double life. Mark, being a civilian, he wore a wire three years, and we never gave him any mental health counseling at all. We just treated him like a robot, wired him at 6 in the morning, and said, go do it for us, Mark. So they said they wanted a plea agreement for me for that fraud because of the pressure that I was under and the mistakes that I made wearing a wire. The U.S. attorney said, gave a deal of a lifetime. He agreed to a six-month plea agreement in a kind of prison that Martha Stewart went to. White-collar prison, no fence, six months there and come home six months later for that $9 million fraud. A deal of a lifetime. My lawyer calls me in Chicago. He's a judge now. said, Mark, he and the agents got, got me a deal of a lifetime. Six months in federal prison 
All I have to do is sign this plea agreement. Ginger was by my side as always. She said, Mark, I'm begging you to sign this. Let's get this behind us. I know you had full immunity, but now with this $9 million, you deserve some punishment. Sign this plea agreement. Let's go home. Go do your prison time. In six months, it's behind you. I said, Ginger, you're the one got me in this mess in the first place. I would never, you want me to sign this, I would never sign it. I took that plea agreement, threw it in the trash can, fired that lawyer on the spot, hired lots of lawyers, ended up hiring 11 lawyers over three and a half years, fought the case for three and a half years, and got a ten and a half year sentence three and a half years later. And had a six month deal in my hand. Ginger gets asked often at events where she does the Q&A at events, especially at couples events. And they ask her, they say, Ginger, divorce rate for someone who goes to prison is 78% divorce rate if you're incarcerated, 78%. If you go to prison five years and longer, it's a 99% divorce rate if you serve five years and longer, the official statistic. And they say, Ginger, how'd you do it? With a 99% divorce rate, your husband in prison for eight and a half years, how did you do it? And Ginger said divorce was never an option. God would not allow her to get a divorce. But she said murder was an option, and she considered it twice. She said, when my husband threw a six-month deal in a trash can, murder was on the table. And I can tell you firsthand, it was. I saw her face. She actually told me a couple weeks ago, it's still on the table. I was my own worst enemy every step of the way. And just like Martha Stewart, just like Michael Milken, I went from a corporate jet, just like the Enron executives, the WorldCom executives, national TV, from a corporate jet to handcuffs in jail, and not for six months, but for eight years and eight months. In the federal system, there's no parole. You get 15% off for good behavior. Parole was taken out in the 80s. I went to prison in the 90s. So you get 15% off good behavior. So I had to do eight years and eight months on a ten and a half year sentence. And I would have had six months. My own worst enemy every step of the way. Well, that's where the movie ended. The movie, The Informant. That's Ginger and I with my identical twin, Matt Damon. I think you can see why they chose him since he and I look just alike. I'm the one on the right, by the way. You can't see which one I am. These are some of the books and movies and documentaries on the case. And New York Times wrote a book uh, in 1999. Uh, Rats in the Grain was written by an antitrust lawyer in 1999. Mark Whitaker Against All Odds came out in 2010. That's more our faith journey. That's sold in Christian bookstores. And that's more the rest of the story. It has a lot about the case, but a lot how we survived it and what God's done in our life. Then the movie The Informant, Hollywood took a very serious book that's written like the firm, The Informant, and did a comedy out of it. So the FBI was upset that it was a comedy, by the way. And they did the documentary six months later in 2010 that's on my website uh, called Undercover. And it's on my website, markwhitaker.com, the full one-hour uh, documentary. When I threw that six-month deal in a trash can, and now sitting on an eight-year, eight-month sentence that I had to do, a ten-and-a-half-year sentence, but eight years and eight months that I had to actually do, almost nine years, I wrote a 17-page letter to Ginger. I wrote letters to my three children. I was so ashamed of myself at all the mistakes that I made and reading about all that in the newspaper every day, USA Today and Wall Street Journal. I was so sick of myself, I pulled my car in the garage and tried to kill myself. I didn't want to live. I felt like I didn't deserve to live what I did to my family. And I don't know if any of you have ever written a letter to your wife to say goodbye, but I can tell you, it's the most dramatic experience you will ever have in your life, is to write a letter to your wife and kids to tell them goodbye, because you're going to kill yourself. But that's where I was. That's where I was during that period of my life. We had a groundskeeper. He showed up at 8.30 every morning for seven years in a row. I wanted him to find me in that garage because it was a garage that was detached from the house. And I didn't want my family to find me. He showed up at 6.30 one morning. Something tugged at his heart. Showed up at 8.30 in the morning, seven years in a row. He showed up at 6.30. He saw me in the garage unconscious. Opened the garage door. I was taken by an ambulance to the hospital. I was hospitalized for a month. The doctor said I was 20 minutes from passing, 
based on my carbon monoxide levels, 20 minutes. If he would have showed up on time, I would have already passed for two hours earlier. And I was so upset with him because he spoiled my plan at the time. I know differently now, but at the time I was so upset with him. I was hospitalized for a month, as I said. This man, his name's Ian House, read about me in the newspaper. He's CFO of a large pharmaceutical company, part of a group called CBMC Christian Businessmen Connection, which is uh, sponsoring uh, this event tonight, CBMC. And this would have been September 1997. And he said, God put it on his heart to reach out to me. Him being CFO of a pharmaceutical company, me being divisional president of a biotech company, he thought there were some similarities that maybe I would listen to him. My wife told me someone was out on the porch that wanted to talk to me. I said, is the media? I can't talk to the media, media anymore. She said, no, it's someone that has nothing to do with the media. I went out on that porch. He told me who he was. Five young children, school age and younger. His wife and an attorney. CFO of a pharmaceutical company. Part of CBMC. And he said, Mark, I want to tell you something. Prison is going to be the beginning of your life. I've been reading about you in the papers. I saw where you took a six-month plea deal and threw it in a trash can. And I want to let you know, Mark, this is the beginning of your life. Prison is going to begin to be the beginning of your life. And you're going to find your true purpose in life with the journey you're ready to start. I ran back in the kitchen and told my wife, I said, Honey, there's somebody on the porch that thinks this is the beginning of my life and I'm getting ready to leave in seven months for nine years of jail. And he thinks this is the beginning of my life. She fell to her knees. And she said, Finally, God sent somebody. She said, I've been trying to talk to you about this for 10 years. But God finally sent somebody. And I pray you go listen to this man. Because you sure haven't listened to me. And I went back out on that porch because I could tell how much it meant to my wife, Ginger. I went back out on that porch. I said, Ian, what do you have in mind? He said, I want to introduce you to Jesus. I said, Ian, I said, my parents forced me to go to church as a youngster. I've been going to church almost my whole life. I go to church every Sunday with my wife and kids. I'm a Christian. I go to church. He said, Mark, I'm not talking about going to church. I'm talking about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You will find your purpose in life. I said, Ian, how do you do that? He said, well, normally I spend about an hour a week with somebody with a study called Operation Timothy, OT. Wonderful, wonderful tool. He said, I usually spend about an hour a week with somebody going through Operation Timothy. But he said, you're getting ready to leave for, in seven months for a decade. So I'd like to spend six, seven, eight hours a week with you. A man that was CFO of a pharmaceutical company and five young children and his wife and attorney. He spent six, seven, eight hours a week with me. And I can remember saying, Ian, I think my sins are too big for God to ever forgive me. How can he forgive me? Look what I've done to my family. And he would go through scripture with me and we'd spend hours when I'm telling you in a minute or two. We go through scripture. He said, Mark, no matter what your sins are, God will forgive you and give you a clean slate. And I said, I'm a scientist, PhD scientist. I can't see God. How do I get to God? He said, Mark, the bridge to God is Jesus. Jesus died for your sins, a horrific death on the cross. And your bridge to God is through Jesus. He died for your sins. And like I said, when I'm sharing in a minute or two, we shared for hours. My second week in prison, Yazoo, Mississippi, I'm seven months with Ian House. He planted a strong seed, but I wasn't there yet, but I was getting there. And Chuck Colson showed up my second week in prison, Yazoo, Mississippi. I didn't even know who he was. I knew President Nixon, obviously, and I knew Watergate, but I never knew the name. Uh, this all happened in 75 and 76. I was graduating high school in 75. And Chuck Colson showed up and said he'd been reading about me in the Washington Post. He said he went to Brown University in Ivy League. I went to Cornell. He said he became top of his game in, in politics, White House counsel right next to President Clinton or President Nixon in the Oval Office right next to, he had an office right next to the Oval Office under President Nixon. And he said that he was top of the world just like I was top of the corporate world and we both ended up in federal prison for $20 a month. And he said, thank God it happened. It's the best thing in the world that ever happened to him. And he started telling me all the same things Ian Howes was telling me. And this man between Ian Howes and Chuck Colson, they poured their lives into me, and still Ian Howes pouring his life into me still today. 
We're doing an event together in September in Chapel Hill. Together. Chuck Colson would meet me monthly and send me things weekly for nine years of federal prison. And for the first six years that I got out, in 2006, a decade ago, and he, until he died four years ago this week, April 21st, four weeks ago, he died. And he poured his life into me. So when we talk about ambassadors for Christ, what marketplace ambassadors are, I met two effective marketplace ambassadors face-to-face with Ian Howes and Chuck Colson. God put two in my life, and I know what ambassadors look like. They impacted my life and planted a seed that changed my life forever. Ten months after I met Ian Howes, three months after I met Chuck Colson, I got down on my knees in a 10 by 10 with a concrete floor after a 13,000 square foot house for seven years. I was in a 10 by 10 with a locker and a roommate, concrete floor for nine years. And I got down on my knees my third month in jail. March, this would have been June 4th, 1998. I went in March of 98. June 4th, 1998, I surrendered my life to Jesus. The first time in my life at age 41, even though I went to church my whole life. Then I knew the difference between going to church and surrendering your life to Jesus Christ and being a follower for Jesus. And there's a huge, huge difference. I felt a peace and contentment that I'd never felt in my life that God would take care of things. And this is $20 a month after $3 million a year for seven years. $20 a month for nine years. $20 a month. God forgave me. He pardoned me. He redeemed me on June 4th, 1998. And he gave me a clean slate. And then he touched the hearts of society to give me a second chance. My wife, when federal prison, there's no parole, but with good behavior, you get to go to a better place. So I started off Yazoo, Mississippi, which is not a good place. And then I got to go to Edgefield, South Carolina, which is a better place. It's Carolinas too, right, by the way? And then I got to go to Pensacola, Florida. They rank federal prisons on Forbes list just like they rank universities. And Pensacola, Florida, Navy base is the number one ranked federal prison. Keep that in mind if you ever need to know that. (laughs) So I got to go there for my last five years. My wife moved to Yazoo, Mississippi, walking distance from that prison. Her and my kids then moved to Edgefield, South Carolina. They lived in Aiken, 20 minutes out of Edgefield. And visited me every weekend. Then they moved to Pensacola, Florida. Walking distance from that prison. My wife and children moved to all three of those states. Next to those prisons. They allow your family to come in Friday evenings. And all day Saturday and all day Sunday. In a visiting room setting. They came 20 hours a weekend. Which the maximum allowable hours. For nine years. 700 inmates. And five wives coming. 700 inmates. 99% divorce rate. It's a miracle of God. A miracle of God. In the book Against All Odds, they added her days up from prison records. How long her and my children spent eight hours a day in federal prison, and her days added up to three years and eight months. My family went to jail with me. And I've been out a decade, and I know God forgives me, but I can tell you, There's not a day I don't wake up that I think about what I put my family through. I put them through a living hell. The food companies we stole from, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Kraft, they won billions of dollars back, $3 billion. Coca-Cola alone won $400 million, just one company, $400 million. Reimbursement for that fraud we did on the price fixing. Those companies had a lawyer in D.C. called Dick Stein and Shapiro was a law firm, the lawyer named Ken Adams that represented those companies, they called my wife and they said, Ginger Whitaker, if it wasn't for you, price fixing would still be going on like it was for 12 years. My wife was literally about ready to move at home with her mom, with our kids, because we were running out of money. This is August of 98, and I went to prison in March of 98. And she was about ready to move back home with her mom. She got this call. And said, Ginger, with you doing this in this case and exposing this fraud that no one else in that company did for 12 years, and your husband for wearing that wire, even with the mistakes he made, wearing a wire for three years, we're going to take care of your family for nine years while your husband's in jail. 
They put a trust fund together that paid every bill my family had for nine years. My daughter went to Duke, master's at Duke. She's a school teacher outside of uh, in Durham, right near Duke today, 14 years later. Our youngest son, an MBA from Georgia Southern. Ginger went back at school and college with the same funds from those companies to become a school teacher. She was teacher of the year of our city in 2007. They paid every expense we had, a house payment, a car payment, their kids' college for nine years. The people I stole from, a miracle of God. The FBI agents and prosecutors, you can go and look at my website and the documentary they did in 2010 and other news clips, they became my biggest supporters. You'd think they'd throw away the key and forget about me. I stole $9 million when I worked for them. Then I took a six-month deal. They worked hard to get me and threw it in a trash can. And they became my biggest supporters. Miracle of God. I thought I'd never get employed when I got out. I was getting out at age 49. I went to prison at age 41. I got out in 2006. Cornell University started writing me in prison where I graduated in 1983. They started writing me when I went to prison to send me articles, medical journal articles, and so on. They started having companies visit me in prison like it's a recruiting ground at a college. And they had four opportunities for me the day I got out of jail. I joined a company that had a Christian CEO that Cornell University was very close to, that Cornell did the prostate cancer research for this company, a biotech company. And I joined that company in 2006. By the way, you don't, for, especially for the young people, you don't start off the head of finance when you steal $9 million. But I had a job. I had a job being a scientist and being a researcher. And I've had four promotions in that company until I became the COO, the number two executive at that company. Miracle of God. God touched the hearts of society and gave me a second chance. And I was so blessed to have that job. In the last couple of years, I've went full-time. I'm still on the advisory board of that company, but I've went full-time at CBMC because I feel nothing more important than share what Jesus has done in my life as a witness for Jesus Christ. As a scientist, I live on evidence. And I don't live on just faith alone anymore. I've seen the evidence, the evidence that's right there on that chart. I've seen the evidence that God exists. God is not dead. God exists. And I've seen the evidence in my own life because statistics was against me on all of these things. To keep my family, to be reemployed, the agents, FBI agents to forgive me, and so on. That's my family today. My wife and I and our three children. The one that looks the most like us is our daughter-in-law next to my wife, in front of my wife. She's closer and stronger than ever. I watched my 30-year-old son, who was six when this was going on, give his testimony at CBMC Cincinnati and give his testimony. He said, thank God his dad went to prison. He got to spend 20 hours a weekend with me for nine years. He said it was the greatest blessing he ever had to have a dad that had no cell phone, that had no text message, that had no TV, that got 20 hours a weekend attention for nine years. He saw it as a blessing. Only God could do that. A family closer and stronger than ever. I am blessed to be here tonight. And thanks for having me. And God bless all of you. And I'll be praying for your city the days, weeks, and years ahead. Thank you. Thank you.